part two with Mike Greenlee. Just a good conversation. All right, so school's done. Baseball's done. We have found our love of art. We're doing graphic artist work yep. on computers. Yep. Cutting edge at that point, right? It's not that this has been around for 50 years. This is new. Fairly new, yeah. We're, we're around Photoshop 3. Right. <laughs> But still, that's no. I, I'm yeah. I'm just like that was layers, early. Right? That, that's the first time. That was the first time. It was. It, I actually my, my my first thing. My first internship. We did not have layers in Photoshop. Oh boy. So that's that's where we're, that's where we're at. I mean, if, right. if you understand Photoshop, yeah. that's a that was a base that wasn't even a feature. Graduation happens. Where do you go? Um, actually, graduation happened for me in 1998. So. I finished playing in 97. Right. I still had another year worth of school left because being a baseball player and an art major didn't mix. So I was sure. constantly taking my non-art classes and I had to catch up. So my last uh, full year of school was all art classes. Um, that must and, have been interesting. Yeah, I mean, it was when you're done being an athlete, there's a lot of pressure taken off you. There's a lot of responsibilities and all kinds of stuff that comes with just being a student athlete. So um Taking that burden off of the table was, uh, it almost made the art part easier or easy. Um, so I finished that, but I had to take an internship. And um, I found an internship through uh, the, the university, through the art department. They had a list of people to call, and I made a number of calls to places. Um, that's nice. Yeah, it was it was really cool. And then one of them called me back and you know did an interview and make a resume and all that stuff. And um, oh, didn't that, that's something okay, right? So was there any, even though it's art, was there any structure, anything talked about what's going to happen with business? No. And that's that's a and, pet peeve of mine. Yeah, there was there was from from the university side. No, there was nothing. My dad was constantly in my ear. You got to get some business education. You got to get some business education. I'm like, Dad, I don't like that. He was right. I should have because that's a a big part of um, just that knowledge is great. But if you do any freelance, that is a that's almost sixty seventy five percent of the business of doing that that work and right. and I dipped my toe into that and because I was uneducated I probably failed a lot because of that um, so no the answer is there was no education on the business side other than what you know a general education business class or right. my high school senior economics well, type that's not that's yeah, not high, fine. high school's not going to cover yeah, yeah. you but there's nothing worse okay so you got these art people some of them like you said you have two professors that are have some real world right and nobody says to any of you okay so you're gonna might have to want to know how to do a tax form freelance business right None i don't of think that. there was quick bucks back then but anything everybody just assumes you graduate, you get a job, you work nine to five, and everything's taken care of. Right. No. 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 You've been freelancing since I've known you, and you've been freelancing before that, and that means you've got to learn business one-on-one. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, it's all been on the fly. It's trying to pay attention. I go back to you know those baseball days where I'm sitting on the bench right next to the coaches when I'm not pitching, listening, watching. That was my education on a lot of stuff coming up in my future. Um, college gave me a degree. It gave me that, you know, the next step, the the open door to the next step. Um, but nothing necessarily was like, here, you've got this figured out. Now you're going to get paid for it. Right. Um, so my internship was with a small uh, marketing company. Um, they local. Uh, it was in Anaheim. Okay. Um, over by that, the lake off of uh, La Palma. Yep, Is it La Palma? Yep, There's yep, a lake over there. Yep. Um, Good the fishing. Small, yeah, small little, small little company. And uh, there was four employees, and they did credit union marketing. Okay. So it was a small niche. They did newsletters. Um, so there was the owner, and he would come up with the marketing plans. And then there was a creative agency, which ended up being 
uh, two other designers and myself as an intern uh, creating marketing pieces. Basically, all that stuff that you used to get in your uh, envelope for uh, your bank statements that you just turn, rip right. up, and throw away. Very meat and potatoes. Yeah, but the credit union is a more family-oriented, slowed-down pace of of marketing. So they were talking about home equity lines of credit and <laughs> auto loans and home right. loans and things like that. So it wasn't really exciting, but it got my feet in there, in the door to how graphic design really applies in the real world. You yeah. don't get this you don't get this fake project of come up with the brand of blah 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 right. and then show me what it looks like on a bag. Um, it was these people are paying us X amount of dollars. That's it, X yeah, amount. Yeah. Like well, don't yeah, don't mess with it. We need to do it in as few hours as possible and we need to make it look good. Right. So that kind of was like right up my alley. I was taking taking good ideas and already built up ideas and I just need, need to put pictures to them. Um, so it was a really good, good step for me. Um, I eventually got hired on full time at that company. Nice. Um, okay. so I, I did a good job, worked my way up. And How many became, people? Uh, at the time there was the owner and like a creative, a writer and a designer and myself. Okay. So small um, team of four. A very small team, but at, in the next few years, we brought on a project manager. The owner kind of stepped away. The creative writer became more of a creative manager, and we brought in a writer. All of a sudden, there's a staff of 10, and then the owner sells the company to a large company in Minneapolis um, called Liberty, and they were a check printer. So at the time, in the credit union hmm. industry, we're doing marketing for this. Now we get this company that buys us and they sell checks to the country, not just Southern California credit unions, but they sell checks to all the credit unions in the country. The actual physical right. before debit cards checks. Right. Um, so now we've got there. So we start bringing in more and more designers. And now we're a staff of 15 and 20. There's salespeople and all kinds of stuff. So it, it grew. And I was there when it grew. Um, but kind of like like it is later at Cal State Fullerton, just the work became so all encompassing. There was there was so much for me for me. I mean, some of those people stuck around and stayed, but it got to the point where I was like, I'm here. I'm here overtime. I'm stressed all day long. I'm doing the same thing every single day for the same clients who have the same problems every single month. <clears throat> I can do this on my own. So I actually like. I had gotten married to my first wife, um, you know, moved out and said, I got this. If my company's charging $133 an hour for my services right now, and they're really relying on my services, why can't I step out and charge 75 to 100 on my own, not have any overhead, I can work out of my house, all these things. Right. Like, this is my non-business knowledge, <laughs> just putting numbers together going, I got this. Right. So at the same time, I wasn't stealing clients, but the clients that were leaving the company, I was approaching them as I was leaving, saying, I will do your work for you um, at this cost. And I got a couple of them that were leaving the other company. I sure. wasn't stealing anybody, no, but the, the other people were, were leaving, and I, I grabbed them as an opportunist and left the company and started doing freelance. And I had a really good year and a half to two years really good like this is late 90s early 2000s uh, yeah it was actually 2001 okay um and actually it was like just prior to september 11th so i was working at my apartment with my wife and she's a, a freelance she was a, a teacher and a, a vocal coach um, so she was working outside so we were both independent contractors and i was doing well and things just couldn't be better at the time and but there was no business aspect i was i was taking in large jobs and i was floating that money to pay for the next job the next job at the end of the year it was great but from month to month from day to day it was it was a struggle but those jobs were just coming to me i wasn't doing any marketing for myself i wasn't looking for new clients i wasn't actively pursuing the business i was going month to month so um, looking back, 
I'm glad I had that experience for sure, but it was not secure, wasn't stable, wasn't uh, wasn't the right thing for me. I mean, it was the right for, thing for me then, but I I didn't have any business doing business like that. Right. Like I, I wasn't educated. Um, eventually it got to the point where, um, could you see when you were in it, could you see the business problem or were you just making it work? Um, I was seeing it, I was making it work, but I was seeing that it was a problem. Okay. At the same time, what I was doing also was not focusing on my business. So there was, there was all kinds of stuff. So I'm newly married, off on my own. We're living, you know, together now. And I've got all this freedom with my new business. I don't have a job. I don't have to wake up at a certain time. And then an opportunity calls where my alma mater high school wants to know if I want to coach baseball. So I'm now a year and a half, two years, three years out of playing baseball, and this sounds amazing. Sure. So I call up my old high school buddies and go, what do you got? What do you think? Us three going back to our alma mater and being a coaching staff. They're like, we're all in. <laughs> it was awesome. It was the greatest thing ever. The worst thing that could possibly happen to my business. Right. Um, so it was all my fault. All my fault. There was, you know. When you don't have a time card that you have to punch into, uh -huh. when you don't have anybody to answer to, right. and you don't have an alarm that you have to wake up to, as long as the work's getting done. Right. But you're not growing the business. You're just oh. doing the same thing, pushing it, just getting by. Just getting by. You weren't just marketing. You weren't doing any promotion. You weren't digging for real other additional clients. No. Just cranking no. out the work. Just cranking out the work exactly what they asked for. I wasn't, there was no principle on my side. Like I'm not standing up for anything. They said, I need this and I want it to look like this. I'd give it to them. So it wasn't very, it didn't make me feel good. Right. It wasn't creative. It wasn't creative at all. And then eventually the people that I was asking to help me out on things, they started falling off. So all of a sudden now I'm writing the newsletters and designing the newsletters and printing the newsletters and doing all of these, you know, side things. I'm not billing on time. I'm not uh, keeping up with my tax work. I'm not keeping up with any of, any of that important, important stuff. Right. Um, but you're coaching. <laughs> having a great time. I mean, I'd go and I'd work until about 1130 and I go, it's about time for lunch. 12 o'clock rolls around. Well, I can't go back and work for an hour. I might as well go to the park for a while. I'd go to the, the baseball field, and then everybody would hang out there, and we'd play catch and loosen up, and then we'd have a whole – I'm running a JV team like a college team, so we're having a full, like, talk and this and practice and throwing BP, and then we'd sit down and we'd break down practice. At, we're talking JV-level baseball right. here. It's like – I get home at like six o'clock. <laughs> After watering the grass and yeah. dragging the field, sure. all the stuff, six o'clock. Then I'd like cram to get that stuff. So as you can see, I'm putting in three hours of work a day or four hours of work a day during baseball season. Right. So that didn't work out. Um, luckily for me, during that time period, the moment I graduated in, in, two, in 1998, Dave Serrano, who was the assistant coach at the time, the pitching coach, um, was talking with our media relations director at Cal State Fullerton, and he said, well, you're a graphic design major, why don't you design our media guide? At the time, media guides were just literally... Pamphlets. Pamphlets with cutout pictures, especially pasted at, up. Especially at Cal State Fullerton. Is, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cal State. And my boss was really old school. He was still, when I got there, he was actually doing pay stubs. We can say his name. He's not Mel Franks. wanted by yeah, the yeah, FBI. Yeah. <laughs> Mel Franks, my, my, my first Love boss Mel. at, at, right. at uh, Cal State Fullerton. He was actually doing pay stubs. He, the, the previous year's media guide, he handed to me on cardboard sheets of graph paper with paste and percentages of photos, meaning he'd give me a photo and it said 80%. He wanted the photo to be 80% of less. that size. Yeah. Um, I always found it interesting that Serrano had an eye creativity like he he understood that the importance of a media guide for marketing and yeah. for recruiting yeah. and its purpose even when he became the coach 
at yeah. Irvine and it was at important Fort, to him. He was it was very image, important. The image yes. was very important to him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, that's rare for a coach then to even pay attention that there was a media guy. I, I, he never flipped through one. No, no, he had he had no he had no part of it. Really, he didn't care. No. Um, it, I mean, it wasn't important to, right. to him. I mean, the, but maybe Dave was ahead of his ahead of his time on, so. on that because I, I mean, Dave that's was ahead of it. that's uh, it was important for a long time, and there aren't a lot of media guides still being produced. But no, um, but during that but during that during, during that time, it was a big ordeal. Right, it became what the internet is now. Media guides became an actual marketing war <clears throat> who yep. can have a better media guy to the point where the NCA had to regulate it they had to regulate it with page sizes and page numbers and all that stuff I remember the first book that I got I think was 32 pages and uh, I increased that over the years um, me and Ryan Ermeling who was the predecessor to me in that job full time um, we both bolstered that book up with records and numbers and then I stepped up the design he stepped up to the design um, so that was that, that was my next move was or not my next move it was a part of the next move because Dave asked Mel to have me do it then I started doing media guides for Mel on the side just right I'll, I can pay and it wasn't even a how much is this gonna cost he'd say I have hundred and fifty dollars will you do this type of thing so it was yeah absolutely that's awesome so I did that and then at some point, Mel was like, "Hey, have you ever kept score before?" And I'm like, "I, I, you know, go to the game and I write base hit in the little diamond." And he goes, "No, it's a lot more than that. It's, you know, it was really cool how he taught me how to keep score." But he's like, "I need someone to come in and be the media relations director for baseball." I'm not real sure what the reasons are, but it was a really small shop. It was him and Jody Rogenson and Jason Pommier, and I think Jason Pommier had left, and Jody was either getting ready to leave, right? So he was by himself and needed someone to cover baseball. Um, and he had spent his life covering the baseball team, so it's it's amazing that he actually gave that up. But um, uh, well, the man wore so many hats, yeah. That at some point, if Jason's leaving, Jody's on the way out. He's gotta, yeah. You need to get some help. I needed some help, so he kind of showed me the ropes on how to keep score, and then said, do you, "What do you think?" you think you can do this? And I'm like, what does the job entail? He kind of showed me. He's like, you just write a little recap of what happened in the game. And we've got a website and you got to go through all these 23 steps to get logged in and set up on like this old, you, you're doing it in whatever was before Dreamweaver. Like you're right. I think uh, somebody had designed them a basic just website with HTML. It was awful. Java. It was brutal. It was bad, bad, bad. Um, and like zero photos. It was very type heavy. It was and, all, yeah, that's all it was. Right. I mean, but you're uploading stories and box scores and I'm like, yeah, this sounds cool. And it was extra money. It sure. was, it was, an, uh, it was in addition to additional work in, in yeah, the week. Yeah. yeah. So it Why wasn't, wouldn't it, you take it? Yeah. It wasn't a lot. And I was getting my foot back in the door with baseball and that kind of stuff. So, um, I did that part time for a while. I did it for ninety eight, ninety nine, and then some <laughs> midway through the two thousand one season, I was down on the field getting the lineup for the game, and Coach Horton goes, "I heard you were replaced." And I'm like, "I don't know what you're talking about." <laughs> Walk back up to the press box and ask Mel, and he's like, "Yeah, we hired Ryan Ermeling as full time. We needed somebody full time. We right. opened it up, and he applied, and he's coming with good credentials and." So I, I don't know. I wasn't I was upset that day that I had been replaced without even being talked to. And that was nothing I mean, I don't think it had anything to do with Mel or Coach Horton or anything. It right. was just a circumstance that I got caught in the middle of. Um, but Ryan came in full time and then I just stuck around in the press box and played the music and right, uh, because, did the scoreboard and Because baseball was as entertainment was changing. Yeah. So when you played, no walk up music. Right, I actually had a walk-up song when what I'd come into it? pitch. It was the uh, M uh, Darth Vader's theme from oh, Empire. There you go. But no one else had that. They would play it when the opposing pitcher would come in as like, oh, here comes the evil guy. And I told Jason Pommier, I'm like, hey, can you play that when I come in, please? And he's all, yeah. So it turned in my senior year. I was really the only bum, one that they bum, would play bum, a song. Bum, bum, bum. Yep. Right. So you were the only one. I, I, Suck it, Kotze. Remember, yeah. From what, from, <laughs> from what I remember, I was the only one. And I don't know if it was every time, but 
uh, on senior day. I've got a video of me pitching in senior day, and they're playing it as I'm running in. So, right. like, it no, vi- no video board. No video board. Um, same scoreboard, same though. Same scoreboard. <laughs> it was just this rinky dink, three color, light bulb scoreboard. Yeah, at the time, it was like high quality. Sure, it was they state had, of the art. Yeah, it was run on Do- a DOS machine. But now we're playing music all the time. Yeah. And it's becoming, there's been the expansion. Mm-hmm. The stadium's now expanded. We're yep. talking about ho- hosting super regionals now. And it was becoming a bigger ordeal in the park to match the, I guess, the gravitas of the team. Yeah. I mean, and, you know, playing, uh, keeping up with the Joneses, you well, know, as, as this is happening across the country on bigger and, and broader levels, uh, right. Cal State Fullerton is doing its best to, to try and keep up with the staff that they have. So, yeah. Um, so you're playing music. I'm playing music, filling in whatever. If Ryan had to miss or needed help uh, during the postseason, I was doing that media relations job. Um, you know, 2004 rolls around. They win another national championship, and Ryan had started his own company out of his garage. At this point, me and my wife had moved into the house I currently live in, and Ryan was my next-door neighbor. So I'm working next door to Ryan, who is starting a company in his garage, uh, which ended up being Stretch Internet, uh, which broadcasts college games over the Internet. It was a a platform for people to purchase a pioneer. Uh, It was, yeah, it was great. He had, he had taken, I I think it was Mark Cuban's broadcast.com model and tweaked it to be affordable to all schools and everywhere. Because prior to that, you had to be a major university with a radio station. Yep. And that was going through. And And after that, there was nothing else. So little schools like a Pepperdine or a Fullerton or Montana, you had to have this, and it worked. It was a good price point. It was great. I um, I want to say it was like two thousand dollars for the year for any number of broadcasts. You know, for all your sports. For all your sports. So if you had fifteen or seventeen, like Cal State Fullerton did, two thousand dollars broken down over all those sports for a year is nothing. And yeah. It's dro- and their customer service was fantastic, and all of these things that came with it. So Ryan, after the two thousand four national championship, told me I'm taking this full time. I'm taking my business full time. I'm leaving Cal State right. Fullerton. He was swapped. Yeah. Oh, he was because I was working other events. He would go, "Hey, do you mind watching over this? I got to run home because the computer crashed or something happened." So right. I was, you know, backing him up while he was, you know, stepping away from his <laughs> responsibilities to take care of business. But um, there were a number of times that that happened. Um, but he said, "I'm leaving." you should put your name in for the full-time job and then take my take the spot full-time. At the time, it couldn't have been perfect. I was running through not only, you know, that lack of work coming in, um, I was going through a divorce. Um, I had just purchased a house, all these things, so I, like, needed a job. I needed a real job and right. a job <laughs> that was going to pay me. And I had given it no thought, and I said yes i applied and um i don't know if i was their only pick or if it was a decision but that that moved pretty quick so october 2004 i had myself a full-time another full-time job but not as a graphic designer i was now a media relations director and that's a whole different world yep you're now dealing with your software i'm sorry volleyball Mm mm-hmm and baseball were your primary sports. Yes. But then you also started to handle those duties that come along with it, dealing with the teams, the websites, and everything. So it just Yep, the media, didn't... the TV, right. all the all the stuff. And we're coming off a national championship year, so there's a lot of high expectations for baseball. Um, though a lot of that job entailed a lot of writing. I wasn't a writer. I didn't go to school to write. Right. I didn't go for journalism. So I was learning on the fly. I'd learned a little bit from Mel. How much did you rely on him? Because he's got just so much info. Early on, I felt like I was annoying him with the questions. So okay. I, I leaned on him a lot early on. Um, I leaned on him a lot until he retired. Um, but I learned on the job. I was, again, because I think I sat back and watched and listened and evaluated, I did a lot of the same. And he was like 
Coach Kareni and his demeanor and in the way he went about his business. He was like George Horton in the way he went about his business. Um, a lot of people wouldn't see that, but I just I feel like he did the job, what he needed to do, when he needed to do it. Not a lot of questions, not a lot of argument. I, I really admired the way he went about his business. Heads so, down, get it done. Yeah. So, and that's a lot of what Cal State Fullerton was in the past. Like, a lot of, it doesn't matter how you get it done, just get it done. And there was a lot of pride in that. And I got to watch Mel firsthand in those early years as an assistant and now as a full-time person. Um, and I got my education in broadcast journalism from Mel who was old school, very old school. Oh, yeah. Everything. Uh, he would have rather done all the work on a typewriter. Oh, yes. And that's okay. I mean, because the quality of the work was on the paper, what you're reading. Um, so I learned that. I I'm, I'm never say that I'm a good writer, but I'm a way better writer than I ever was. Learned a lot of stuff about grammar and and not bearing a lead in the story and just and, how to tell and, a story yeah it, it's i mean by no means am i talking he is the vin scully of that job right so vin scully if you think about how he broadcasts a game it's very he's not a homer it's not matter of fact right. it's all matter of fact he's telling exactly what happened that's how mel worked every day so i got to watch that so i was never a homer even though i played for the program i'm covering um, yeah, I, mean, I told it I told it how it was. And right. Did, now, did that rub some of the coaches the wrong way? Did you ever find that to be an issue? Because I heard from coaches complaining about Mel not being the homer or the way he wrote the story. But he wrote the story that it could be on any website or yeah. it could be in a newspaper. He didn't write it as propaganda. Right. That's uh, that's where the shift happened in, in that industry. Um, Mel was writing for newspapers, and newspapers were the big disseminator of all the information. Right. So being at Cal State Fullerton, no one cared. But when it got into the Orange County Register, people got to read it. It right. got into the press telegram. People got to read it. And what happens is you've got about 45 minutes after a game to get all the information compiled, put into words and, and faxed over to <laughs> the paper where that person then does a quick skim of what you've written and decides what you're going to put in. Right. He rewrites it and puts it in. Yeah. So all those flowery words to describe how great the team was or this person tried really hard, it's not going to get in the paper. Right. So Mel taught me the inverted pyramid where you tell all this information at the top and at the bottom of the story is a bunch of stuff that is detailed that anybody can use. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I know he, he taught me that. I know that's a general thing that everybody right. uses. But, but you didn't know. I had no idea about any of that stuff. So um, learned that. And I'd say volleyball was, you know, one of those, why, why don't you make it more flowery? And part of it was I didn't understand volleyball. Right. I mean, you have to understand the sport that you're covering. And I was learning. I knew baseball. I could, you know, describe. And they were rough back then, too. Oh, those really bad. Right. <laughs> they were just bad. Right. My first year, they didn't win a game. My second year, I think they won one. I mean, so yeah. trying to write a story where you get destroyed. Yeah, even, even, and I think I got the most criticism when they were actually, for their, for their standards, playing well. Right. Um, my stories were always comparing them to themselves. This is the first time in the program history that they've done this. And this is the first time since 1958 right. they did this. Because they they weren't talking about national level stuff, we were comparing about we we're comparing mediocrity. Right, and week it's, to week, it's Just very <laughs> difficult to get fired up for that, and it's very difficult to write flowery for that. So, um, yeah, there were coaches that did that, and you know, luckily I only had to deal with two at the time: baseball and and uh, and volleyball. And then the baseball coaches, um, you know. Coach Horton, Coach Serrano were very much on let the what happens on the field speak for itself type stuff. So we were reporting that they were winning. Right. They're winning. Like, we, we yeah, we do need the extra, like, push from the media, but there was nothing we could do. We couldn't push harder and say, we really want our game on ESPN, and then all of a sudden it happens. That's, right. not, that's, how, not, that's no. not how it works. So um, we would do our best to get the stories in on time to the paper, to get the score in the in the paper, to get the performance in the paper. Um, 
And I, I tried really hard. I, I don't know. Like, you'd have to ask Mel. You'd have to ask Jason or Ryan or the coaches on how good of an SID I was. But I felt like I was pretty good. I how felt, long did it take for you to feel comfortable in the spot of the SID? Uh... From October of I got 2005. My, I got my ass kicked in 2005 because okay. we were an out away from going to the College World Series, and I wasn't prepared. And I was getting phone calls from our good friend J.D. Hamilton at the NCAA telling me that if I didn't get my work done, that he was going to do blank, whatever. Right. That, and I'm sitting there. We're outs away from going to the College World Series, and I had no idea what I was doing. So I was overmatched that first year. Second year. But that was, I mean. Yeah. So you come into volleyball that if they win a game, eh, baseball that year, they've got to run. They're trying to become a defending champion. Right. They've got Arizona State at home. Mm -hmm. Right. And was it Arizona State? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. And do you look to Mel and say, where do I go from here? Or is he kind of letting you go? I think he. I think he. He let me go. Um, he had when when I got hired. He had like that was my job. Like right. I am now the guy. Um, but all of a sudden, you've never done. Yeah, I was. Got, I was leaning media, on him. You got media in the box now. You got L.A. Times, New York. Tons, uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah. ESPN's taken up some of it. Yeah, Arizona State's people. Right. We have radio. They've got radio. Yep. Uh, it's a circus in there. It's a circus. And, and a lot and, of this. A lot of this unpreparedness comes from the weeks prior. Right. I wasn't ready. I wasn't following the emails that I was receiving because I had never done it before. Right. And th- and to be honest, things were changing. Like all this media needs. We need a. We need you to send us a public service announcement from your university. Right. I we didn't have one. Didn't have one. We did not have one. Yeah. And and even if we did, I have no idea how to, where to find it. Right. Um, I know. So you you really got dropped into the new era of digital at the time. Absolutely. Websites were big. A slow decline in media guide. 2004 was the first time the World Series had been broadcast in HD. Mm -hmm. So as the shift is happening, you're in the middle of it. Yes. And, I mean, I could tell you because I'm playing Monday quarterback on it. (laughs) You're getting barraged by J.D., before you even go to the World Series, prep me all this stuff a week out. We yeah. know you're playing Arizona State, but we need you to give us all this. We don't want it. We don't want it Saturday or Sunday night. We want it Thursday. Yeah. They would rather have the stuff and not use it than never get it late. Correct. Yeah. And, and for you and to be dumped into that, that's that's yeah. tough. I mean, and. F- from his side, I mean, we've seen the other side too. They need that stuff right. that early, or else, he, or else he's swamped. Yes, on, on the because in seventy-two hours, he's got media out there in Omaha. Exactly from so, the country. I didn't know that. I didn't know JD. Right. I didn't know who this guy that kept sending me emails about requests about. I don't know. In my head, I'm going, "Why do you need this? We haven't won the game yet." Right. I understand now, but at the time, being new. Um, so you're getting your teeth kicked in 05, but. On, By 06, do you feel comfortable? Yes, yeah. I was going to say, on top of all of that, uh, Arizona State's coach, what was his name? Pat. Pat Murphy. Pat Murphy was a complete... Tool? Tool, idiot, jerk. jerk in that whole... He was messing up press conferences. He was making the media turn around and sit in their chairs backwards because he didn't want to go into the tent because the year before he went into the tent and they lost, so he wasn't stepping foot into the tent. He was playing all these games on top of all. So I don't know how to and what, navigate. And what bothers me about that is that the NCAA allows that. Right. There's no way that happens. And this is a. This is how, as much as you and I love baseball, that would never happen at the Rose Bowl at any of the big bulls, sugar, orange, right. it would never happen at the men's basketball tournament. No. Even if Coach K said, I need everybody to turn around. But as much as baseball is the third tier of beauty, priority, there's not millions and millions of dollars at stake. No. You don't get a check when you win. Nope. Like, you win the Rose Bowl, there's $28 million. Right. Thanks for playing. Nope. The sixth, seventh, eighteenth guy in charge of whatever NCAA event is being the marshal or who's there, doesn't go to Pat and say, 
get your ass in the tent, act like an adult, don't do this crap. Right. Doesn't happen. And there's nothing I can do either right. as, as a new guy, number one, number two, their media relations director is poking fun at it, thinking like he's got he's got to play that game with his coach. Absolutely, because he's got to deal with them next week. He's got to deal with them next week or tomorrow and or Pat later tonight. Could get him fired. Sure, sure. At that at that, that level, at that for level, sure. level, right? For sure. Pat was walking on water. So I was dealing with all of that stuff. 2006 rolls around. I've got a season under my belt and a new coach. Horton actually ran me through the ringer that year too. Like I'll be honest. Like sure. he's a um, I don't know. He's he's a he's a go getter. He's he's got all kinds of tasks. He's got a way about going about everything, and he wants it done in the order he wants it done in, and it's successful. It, it worked, but I because of how I was handling my business and because I was handling uh, the way I went to school and the way I am, I just kind of let things fall into place. And I learned that year that when Coach Horton needs something, take care of the Coach Horton need, get it out of the way, check it off the list. And by 2006, I had figured that out. So I, I hit the ground running a little bit in 2006 where I felt way more comfortable in tackling these big events. We're, you know, now we're hosting regionals all the time. The team is very successful. The team has a swagger about it. It's not going to lose to anybody. Right. Um, you're getting talent coming in, talent going out. The drafts, we're getting, you know, high round draft picks and things like that. So there's a lot of stuff that you're promoting and there's a lot of stuff that you're keeping tabs on just from the baseball side that lasts from January to June every year. Right. The website's big. Yeah, every, everything, everything, everything we do. The the media guide from January to June, June, July, or July and part of August are a bit of a respite. But then I got to start on volleyball, and in reality, I'm starting on my baseball media guide for January, right? In August, so it was it was a big undertaking. It was big. It was big for me. It was. It really was. You know, it's funny because. We look back at that and go, okay, so the website's getting big, media guides are getting big, but we look at it now, the media guides were on its slide. We didn't know it. Right. Because the website should have been increasing faster than what we were doing at Fullerton. Right. Yeah. It's We, we, were, we were catching up to the media all, guide. All the time. Yes. We were catching up to the media guide. When they hired me... Ryan had done a great job in 2002, three, and four to put together a media guide. And then I think I brought in a little bit of my art background and art stuff to make the book look pretty sharp for two or three years. And then all of a sudden, I forget what was the catalyst for the, the sh there was like a shutdown, like nobody did books anymore. Oh, it was the recession. We didn't have the money to, right. to produce them. And they were like eight to $10,000 print jobs. Right. So I think and the recession in, in 2008 in, or nine. I think it was going into nine. Yeah. So that nine to 10 seized. Nine was the last book we did. Right. Was That was it. So, um, and that was a big thing. I mean, it was a, it's a big part of that job, putting that. It was a publication written and designed by me. There were a lot of stats and stuff left over from years past, but you're writing biographies and updates and, and you're doing promotion for players of the year and things like that in this book um, the year before that it's actually happening. So you're doing it in two, late 2008 for the 2009 team. And uh, it, was, it was a big thing. But, yeah, we were catching up in the media guide, but the media guide is on its way out. Our website, Ryan had built a new website at one point, and that was getting, we were getting a little overwhelmed with that. So in 2005, I think we hired CBS Sports CBS, right? yep. to do our website, and that was a big, it took a lot of that, um, the coding a aspect out of things. So it just worked. It was like, now we can upload content instead of do I want to upload that content because it's going to take me X amount of hours to figure out how to code that. Right. So um, that saved a lot. But at the, like you said, I don't think we were embracing that as a university at the time because we were still embracing putting all our eggs in the media guide basket. Right. Coaches wanted it. You could take it out. You can recruit it, with it's it. It's really ultimately the only <laughs> printed piece that 
anybody was getting about anybody, anything right. at Cal State Fullerton. And, you know, being at the mid-major level, I mean, Cal State Fullerton is really a mid-major. A lot of the oh, sports a lot of the sports will not like to hear that, but Cal State Fullerton is a mid-major. Um, just look at the budget. There's yeah. just, that's the, it. We were running, I want to say, our entire 17, 16, 15 sport budget. Early on in my career, there it was like six million dollars, right? Whatever that that includes Nick scholarship. Makes that a year, yeah. Like that was it was, and even when I left, I and that was with fees, and I want to say we were like at fifteen, maybe seventeen million dollars a year. Maybe, I, yeah. I, I, you don't see it when you're working; you don't see all that money. But I think financially, we we got better over the last few years. I was at Fullerton, but um, yeah, that that was a difficult. Thing it was a difficult thing to give up to that media guy because that was where that's how I got hired, that's where I'm able to release my art outlet. Um, that's that was the pride and joy. That was where I put a lot of work and time and effort and energy into at the beginning of that year, getting that media guy done. So when we stopped doing that, we should have put our energy somewhere else, right? In in the website, but. Um, I don't, I mean, that was, no one well, knew how to do that. That's when you and I started to collaborate more. Mm -hmm. And it went from not just providing you with content, but let's get together, let's come up with a theme, let's have a structure to what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We started doing more elaborate media guide covers and then posters. Right. And then we just found like, we could do this and everybody's got a theme where it used to be the media guide was individually thought through through the right. SID the, the basketball SID for women's basketball and men's basketball the web the media guides can look completely different yeah there was never a theme throughout the athletic department in media no. guides where maybe a Texas or a Stanford had a theme right and also you know what I don't there wasn't a lot of ways to see what other schools were doing unless you went to that school or played that school. Right. Um, and I wasn't seeing a ton of, this wasn't a big thing for everybody. There was always the promotional stuff that they're handing out, but posters weren't a thing like they are now. Um, you know, having a schedule was a thing, but not right. an elaborate poster. Um, media guide covers. I want to say that me and you were like, creative in that realm. We weren't just slapping photos, action shots on the covers of photos. Um, we were, we had themes yeah, and designs through the whole Brown book. Yeah, through the whole book. Right. Um, so I'm not saying we were I mean, innovative, but we were, we were innovating one for Southern California and we were innovating in the sports at a time where we don't know what other people were doing. So we weren't like going, I want to do one just like Kentucky. Right. We, we weren't doing that. We were coming up with our own ideas, and that was really fulfilling in that we were creating things, and me and you were really impressed. <laughs> right. Well, I, I'll toot our horn on this. We did the Bobby Brown Target mm -hmm. shoot, which was kind of a take on what uh, Esquire's cover of Muhammad Ali with the arrows in him. I think Harry Benson did, but I might be wrong on that. That Bobby Braswell, the coach at Northridge, called Mel to say that was a great media guide cover. You don't get opposing coaches even seeing other covers right. enough to get up, pick up the phone, and call Mel and say that a boy. Right. We were actually doing some stuff that was a little different than just slapping action photos and making them kind of blend together. Right. And that's where the posters too. We we did some poster stuff. We just superheroes before Marvel. Right. Like we were just trying stuff. Trying stuff. Um, Harry Potter and the retro baseball cards. Oh yeah. That was right, before retro. Before retro was popular. We, did, yeah, we were we did doing that. that. Seventies men's basketball retro. Yep. White shadow kind of thing going mm -hmm. on. Then the baseball cards where it was. 1940s, 50s, yeah. 60s looking cards. Yeah. We had we had a good time. That was. Uh, did you I, feel the creativity at the time? I did. There was a lot of pressure because pressure maybe on our, because it wasn't, that was on top of our job, on top of my job. Right. That wasn't part of Your my job. job. That wasn't right. part of my job. My job was to create a media guide or a media guide cover, media guide cover, not be creative with the media guide cover. That was me and you doing it because we could. Right. And, um, and that's where I said that in the beginning, the willingness. There was never 
anything I threw at you that you said, mm, you were so willing absolutely, to go out on the ledge and try some crazy stuff that if I would have tried that with Ryan and I love him to death, he would have been like, oh God, how much time is that going to take? Right. Right. You were like, Shh, let's go to Home Depot. Yeah. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. No, that, I know, looking back on it, it was, it was really fun to do really tiresome. I mean, th- some of the videos that we worked on, the media guides, that well, I don't know how many extra hours we put in on right. those things. But. So as the economy goes to crap, I go to Maine and take a video course for three weeks, come back, and I basically tell you, we got a new tool. Right. We're doing video. This is 09. And you were, I think it was all the recession based. Right. You were probably looking for something there had to else be, other ha- than photography right. to, to, to lean You had to have on. another tool. And this tool allowed me to charge more because it was new. Right. And it was quick. We were turning things around. So when I came to you and said, we could do this, you did not blink, which... I don't know why you never blinked until we go to hell, but we were doing things and we've talked about this a million times. Nobody was doing and nobody at Fullerton said, what are you guys doing? No, they, they didn't. They didn't say good job. They didn't say great job. They didn't. They, and they didn't say stop. They didn't say stop either. Yeah, we were doing it and the fans liked it. I'd hear stuff from fans like, that's cool. People would clap when we do stuff and, you know, we display it on a video board or. But we um, were doing, we were doing interviews. We were doing preseason, postseason, pre Pre playoff, right? We, with yeah. with opposing coaches, right? We we weren't we were going out. What and, was that regional ten, <sighs> nine or ten? When we sat all the coaches down, yeah. in between their practices, yeah. We we got their other coaches. We were I don't know, we were a little mini New Mexico, Stanford, Stanford, Dave, and then hmm. somebody else. But we sat them down four or five minutes, asked them some questions, and had that edited and up and running in an hour, right? posted and then we actually went if you remember this we would find their message boards to their schools yeah. and post we'd it post it yeah we go post it to get any kind of views that we could right we didn't really have a goal we just right. wanted numbers people to see it right we just wanted but people to see we it. got 1500 people to watch the new mexico coach talk about a pregame yeah it was a four minute video right and we we were becoming a network. We, were, we, me, and you were a mini network. That um, even today they're not generating that stuff. No, they never will. And, t- and even to the point, remember we bought a recorder so we can hook it up to ESPN's truck. Yes. So we can, and we kept explaining to them, no, we want the clean right. feed. We don't want the ticker. We don't want the score clean because they would always give you the game action. What you see on TV. Right. And all that crap below. No. And we also wanted them to give us every camera angle. They're like, (laughs) yeah, you guys crazy. And we probably didn't have the hard drive space. (laughs) No, but we we, (laughs) We wanted it. We wanted it because we were going to damn if we do try to make something from it. Yep. Yeah. Um, You never shook me off. You're the worst pitcher ever. <laughs> you're the, maybe you're the best catcher. <laughs> no, it's it was it was fulfilling to see that. Pro- I don't know. I think I got a little Renaissance man in me. Like I like cooking. I like building. Oh, I yeah. like art. I like photography. I'm I'm not any one of those things. I would never call myself any one of those things. But you do put your hands on it. But I do. Yeah, I do. And I'm a maker. I'm a renaissance man. I, you know, I like building stuff. So all of that went to that. I enjoyed that process. I enjoyed the going to lunch and thinking of the idea. And then it was so fulfilling, even though there was a ton of work in between when it was all done and we like wipe our hands clean of it and we click play on the video board or we got that thing printed or whatever. There's so much fulfillment in that because it was original. It was ours. No one was telling us we had to do it. Right. Um, we would go to Angelo and Vinci's, <laughs> have the buffet lunch. Yes. To the point they were cleaning the buffet lunch and preparing for dinner. Mm-hmm. And we would come up with... All the while getting hugs from the waitress because right. she knew us. Right. Coming up with three or four ideas, whittling it to one, and just forge forward. Yeah. Yeah. And nobody, God love him, Mel never said, boys, what are we doing? Right. And, and you know, maybe I wasn't 
I wasn't making that part of my job. That was all extra. Right. So I was fulfilling my job duties. I mean, to this day, we can play the video, the baseball opener video with the with Apollo 13, Apollo 11 yeah. soundtrack behind yeah. it. Yeah. And I remember the first time we played it, you can hear a pin drop in the stadium. It was the Earth to the Moon soundtrack. Yeah, right. the, the opening credits right. to that. And you can hear a pin drop. Yep. And everybody just stopped because we never played a video like that before. You know, ESPN would send you videos for games, and it was just garbage, and it was whatever, camera cuts. But we sat in the garage for a day with as much memorabilia as we can collect from Mel and whatever we had, and we made what looks like a real trailer, right. cinema trailer. I remember telling me young about it, and he's like, you did what? <laughs> you didn't have a boom? You just swiveled a camera around here. Right. We had no slider, no boom, no yeah. nothing. And that, that, I mean, that goes to another part that I love about it is we did all this with nothing. Nothing. We, like, gaff tape, sandbags. Right. Like, we did this with minimal stuff that you had, stuff that I had, stuff that I can make in Photoshop, that kind of stuff. Like, it was, it's so fulfilling to do the creation and see the end product. And yeah, what do we play that for? Seven years in a row? Right. Before I said, we should probably stop. And I think we had to re-edit because, no, they, we did because Coach No, they Coach wanted Vanderhoek, us to re-edit they it wanted because it. we had Dave in it and they wanted us to put- Take it out. Take it out and put Rick in. Yeah. But Rick was actually in- He was in a number of times. Right. In the, in the past, in the, in the memorabilia stuff. Right. Um, yeah, but we played that for seven or eight years without stopping and then finally I think they it might have been not on my watch that they stopped playing that as an opening we might have had video board trouble or something yeah, like that now they don't play any of the videos and I still say why don't you play the one where Will watches the 2004 eh we don't it's 2004 so right. long ago it's like we have no content close to that still we have yeah. Haircut videos. I, I don't know. I don't know how many. I don't know how many videos we did. Is it 400, 300, 400 it, it's gotta videos? Be. Um, you know whether they're interviews or creative, and it's such a big. I just remember how big of an undertaking it is. It's it's so simple, but it's also it's work, and I'm glad that we did it and we have I'm, that bank of stuff <laughs> to, to fall back on. There's two that I always think of, right? Because we're, we're we're talking a lot about baseball, but there's two that I always think of for volleyball, right? One is sunset, and the other one is the overhang in the gym with the girls and all the balls around them, surrounded by 800 balls. I built a yep. wooden that was my That was my first photo shoot with you. Was the, it that, or was it the one you... The volleyball walked? the volleyball one but uh, did, with them laying on the floor in the balls? Yes, that was weren't my first. you there as an advisor when I did Chad Cordero? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was that was my first. <laughs> you probably I was, should have thought, what the hell? I was there for your Chad Cordero. I, I, yeah, your Wes Littleton, Shane Costa, and Chad Cordero. I was there for all three of those, too. Yeah. But that was when I was playing music and right. working with Ryan. So, But that was good stuff. Right. So these are all, I mean, I don't know what to say about it. It's... I'm very proud of it. I'm sad that it didn't get, it didn't catch on. And uh, we didn't get the opportunity to build that. There was always financial, we can't, or no, that's not going to work, or what for, or what are we going to get out of that? And um, I think at the time, we got a lot out of it. Maybe me and you got a lot out of it. I think the fans got a lot of, out of it, and maybe a couple of people in the department really enjoyed it. But I don't think that they really understood what we were doing or or what they could have gotten out of it no. in, the, in the end. I no. mean, to this day, they're still using the same cameras that they used 11 years ago to broadcast games. Right. Are they good cameras? Yeah. But how much has technology gone in 11 years or whatever since we we got those cameras so um they're still using the same machines and it's 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 unfortunate that in this day and age when the keeping up with the joneses continues we are falling further and further behind by the non-embracing of technology and and the the funding of things like that right our first trip 2006 
to Omaha. Mm -hmm. Should have been five, but I won't rest that on anybody. 2006 to Omaha. That's your first trip, correct? Yes. So I've been through the 95 team going and celebrating and having to parade without me. Okay. Uh, 2004, Ryan went, and I got to watch it on TV. And then, so yeah, your this is, second year, how, I mean, how overwhelming was it? Because I'm on autopilot. I get there and it's, to me, it's like, yes, I get, I've gotten all through the year to actually now make some unbelievable photos. You, on the other hand, are thrown into the absolute deepest waters. I didn't know what to expect. I don't think Ryan ever told me, he, you <laughs> and, can't. and and maybe and maybe it wasn't that big of a deal to him, and it and it wasn't the same to him. Well, right, but it was evolving again. Yeah, Mel, on the other hand, that was probably his tenth trip, tenth eighth or 12th, trip, right? And every year that's different for him, but he wasn't he wasn't giving me a heads up because I don't know that he knew what what was going on. I think ESPN had just gotten more access than they had had the year or two be before. Right. And um, my phone was ringing off the hook. Oh, my God. Off the hook. Matt and I were I roommates. I thought you were selling drugs. Matt and I were roommates, and my phone was going off the hook before we left. We got off the plane, and I had 10 messages. This is pre-smartphone, right? Yeah. For you. Yeah, it's just normal just, uh, Verizon flip phone right. at that point, oh, uh, Razor God. or whatever. Yeah. Thank God. Um, Matt's got a picture of me from that 06. I'm, he stopped by and saw me in the dugout. I'm on the phone writing notes, and that's kind of how I spent that trip, um, making sure that coach was where he needed to be, making sure that the players that certain people needed were at the right place, making sure ESPN, first and foremost, had who they needed, when they needed, um, you know, fighting with Coach Vanderhoek, who was kind of fiery about not letting players do things during their practice time and trying to manage that and keep it. The um, requests are unbelievable. Yeah, and, and to everybody's, like, defense, they just want what they need. They just, they just want, right. you know, they want to shoot Wes Romer for the ESPN opener. Like, right. you want Wes Romer. That's why I'm here. I'm, I'm here to get Wes Romer on that TV and get Cal State Fullerton on that TV. But they want him when he's supposed to be throwing a bullpen. Or they want the hitter that's hitting in the first group to be in the photo studio during the first group of hitting on the only day of practice. Um, Logistically, I don't know where I'm at. I don't know which way is north. I don't know. I've never been in the stadium, and the stadium is like a labyrinth of tunnels and underground here and move to this this room and go up this slow elevator to this room. So I was I was first my, impressions? over my skis. What's your first impressions of Rosenblatt? Because I don't think – I know at that time we didn't talk about it because I, it, I don't think in 06 there was discussions of it going away. No. So I, we didn't. I didn't make it the sweet. Take it all in. Yeah, I. But it was your first trip. So, did you? How? What? What do you remember? I remember that whirlwind. I don't know that I'd say that I enjoyed it. Like. Right. It's a deep end. Yeah. I. I didn't know. I didn't know the. The uh, the beauty, the the romanticism of of it. I didn't. I didn't know it. I hadn't been there before. Even. Had you even he, he, seen much of it on TV? Just those two. I, I didn't watch the World Series unless Cal State Fullerton was in it. Okay. Um, so, like, and even then, they weren't showing the park. They no. weren't, you know, there's the zoo out in right field, the big dome. Um, but I just remember it being a whirlwind. I was thrown in. Mel, what you was know. there, nine days, something like that? We yeah, that was the last time we won any games. Right. So, yeah, we were there eight or nine days. And that was another thing. Like, I am now dating my current wife and I'm going off on these trips going I'm going to Omaha what does that mean I don't know we're we're leaving tomorrow we just found out yesterday we're leaving tomorrow when are you going to be back I don't know yeah I am packing for 10 days and I'm going to do laundry the world series is over in 23 days I don't know if we're going to be there the whole time or not so that kind of thing. So right. it was really awkward, like trying to navigate a new relationship and 
um, going away um, for that amount of time. We had been through a baseball season or baseball season and a half at that point. Um, <laughs> she was, was she around for the, I think she was around for the 05 craziness, uh, you know, almost going, but that's not like going. And we went and I made it through. Um, I was happy to say that I'd went and every single time that I went, I thought to myself, this could be the last time. Right. And I don't know, like, even at Cal State Fullerton where it was expected that you went, every time I went, I go, this this is it. So take it, take it as much in as you can. I wasn't able to get much in in 2006, but I did get to see some great performances. Wes Romer um, pitching that year was out of this world. And uh, Justin Turner was still playing with, with Cal State Fullerton. That was his third trip to the College World Series yep. in, and almost would have been his fourth had they made it the year before. Um, Romer was unbelievable that year. Yeah. he uh, I, I forget the number, but what do you have, like 150 strikeouts and zero walks? Right. Some, and he shoved it on, was it Scherzer? Yeah. 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 At that, our might, place. that might have been who was at the regional, Missouri. Yeah, it was. So Missouri was the other coach that we talked to. <laughs> that, in 06? No, we're talking 09. Was oh, that. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. but 06, that's where they were there. Yeah, yeah. And he okay. crushed them on that, that uh, Saturday night. Yep. Because they, they both saved their aces on Friday. Yep. So you got to see some great performances. We won some games in Omaha, so I thought that's how it was supposed to be. Um, Did we go to the Drover yet in 06? I don't think we had time. Like, that was one of those things, like, I didn't make any personal time. We were busy. And... Um, I do remember the cloud photos. That's about it. Yeah. There were unbelievable clouds. It's the Midwest. Yeah. And I told them, stop, I'm taking pictures of you. Yeah. <laughs> Me and Vinny Pastano and... Somebody else. Was it uh, Erica Javeria, maybe? Maybe. Uh, yeah. So there was a group of us, and we just we were in Cascio's parking lot, I think. Yeah. Just standing out there. So, yeah, I don't. I don't take a lot back from that particular series. I remember the ESPN stuff, talking to Sean McDonough, the broadcaster, um, before the game. He almost kind of calmed me down because I was like panicking and running all over the place. And <laughs> before the players came up, he like calmed me down and said, take it easy. And so that was kind of cool. Um, so you go back in 07 and then go back in 09. Like at that point of those two years, do you kind of take in the Rosenblatt experience? Yeah. Um, 07 was kind of crazy. One, you weren't there. Yeah. Because um, you had a cabinet photo shoot or something, <laughs> yeah. something you had to do. Yeah. Um, yeah but um, that, well, that, that's still on George. He will yeah, say it's his fault to this day. That was kind of crazy. We were there <laughs> with um, UC Irvine. And mm -hmm. Dave Serrano, my old pitching coach, was the head coach of UC Irvine. And we were there together. Um, and we ended up playing the longest College World Series game in the history of the tournament. And we ended up losing. Coach Horton got thrown out of that game. That kicked us out of the tournament. That ended up being his last <clears throat> game as Cal State Fullerton's coach. Right. And later that fall, a crazy storm of media relations that I didn't know could happen happened, and he ended up leaving and going to Oregon, um, leaving his alma mater and the school that he had been at for years and years and years. Um, that was kind of crazy, and uh, it just so happened that uh, Dave Serrano ended up being our coach after a <laughs> bunch of craziness and him saying that, no, I'm not going to be the coach, and then all of a sudden he was. Uh, something... Rick Vanderhoek was overlooked. There was a big storm of baseball right in the middle of my volleyball season. So, <laughs> God forbid. I know, right in the middle <laughs> Not of that. I actually walked outside to get the news. For, I can't remember who told me, but I got the news right in the middle of a volleyball tournament and came back in and was like shaken because I didn't know what to do. Like, here, we, here I am a couple years into my new job, and all of a sudden the head coach is leaving. And, uh, that particular coach was a big part of my job, taking right. care of that coach. So, Yeah, was, he was your pitching coach, your mentor. He, he was, yeah. You personally knew him for a very long time. Yeah, he's the guy that let me come back after my surgery, right. all that stuff, and now he's leaving and going somewhere else. And like, then the questions fly, who's going to replace him? All the stuff happens in 10 seconds, just like it does these days. Right. But there was no social media 
at the time. So it was all via phone call and text message. And websites. And websites. Ooh. and Yeah, news and actual newspapers. Yes. Like in newspaper articles. So, okay, let's, let's, let's tap into seven. Relationships for, a me, for sports information to photographers. Because <clears throat> that's something I hope people get out of this. How important was it for you to have a relationship with the photographer, a me, and then something like in 07, when we go to Omaha, we rely on somebody else. And as we've told many times in lectures, that absolute disaster and what a photographer provided us. How important is it to have a good working relationship with your photographer? I think I had two different sides to that because I had a creative partner or a creative side to that question, and I have a technical side to that question. As a media relations director, I let the photographer do his job. I am not an art director in that situation. Um, I am hiring a photographer to take care of the photography side of the, the job. From a, from a need standpoint, there's a lot that I need. I need action photos, I need headshots, I need historical reference. And I learned that from you early on. I think I learned it when you were talking to Ryan. And I buy into that, that if you have an on-staff photographer, you're not there to take pictures. You're there to archive history. And that is what you personally meant to Cal State Fullerton. We have 20 plus years of archived history and the media relations person is the person that you are having that relationship with, the photographer and the media relations person. That's just generally speaking across the country. Um, you need trust, you need, um, you need to be speaking the same language, you need to understand what each other does, um, or else there's a lot of criticism. There's a, like, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Right. You know, I, I learned very early on that you are only one man. <laughs> you can't shoot a video and photos from both sides of the field at day and night. Right. Like it's just, it's physically impossible. But when you are an uninformed person, why didn't you get that photo? Why didn't you get this photo? How come you were over there when this was happening? Like, I, I understand that, and I think a lot of that criticism and that goes away. Like that relationship has meant so much to my job and my performance because I always got what I needed because we talked about it first. If I needed something specific, um, you know, we went over yearly, we went over monthly, we went over daily, and then when the big events happen. I've got a bunch of stuff that I got to do. You take care of the stuff. This is what right. this is what you do. Like I, I, I don't. I don't think I ever criticized like any of your work ever. Like in that way. Like why didn't you get me such and such? I understood what you were, what you were after. And and as the as the season goes on, obviously, you know. You're archiving differently. You're you're taking photos differently. Right. I don't need a picture of a guy swinging a bat just to see that he played in our uniform at right. that point. I need the historical significance of an event. I need you to tell a story because I may not be able to tell that story because I don't have time. But if we can put up a photo gallery of you know us winning or losing or um, an emotional aspect of a pregame ceremony, that's where, I don't know, that communication and trust and all that, all those, you know, big words and just regular relationship that comes into play. I let you do your job and, 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 and you don't, you don't tell me how to do mine. Right. <laughs> you're, you're not in the press box telling me how to keep score. I should have done something different. Um, I don't know. Is that answer, yeah, well, that, that yeah, answer the question? Yeah, because I think it gets lost a lot that photographers are trying to shoot for themselves and they lose the aspect that they're shooting historically for the athletic department. 
They're a storyteller. Right. They're not a stock photographer. That's early on if you need to be that. Yeah. But what you're doing is, and I always say this, you want these photos to be relevant when you're no longer on the planet. Mm -hmm. When they need to look for a photo of Wes Romer because his grandkids are putting up a memorial for him or whatever. Right. There's photos. Nobody says, really? We only have them from the backside? Right. So I think a lot of photographers miss that. They're not either communicating with the media relations office, the media relations department's not communicating what they want. And so we, we ran into that ugly in 07 at the College World Series when we hired somebody because I couldn't go on the cover. And they basically, we might as well have not hired anybody. We, can't, we got back nothing. Right. And it was a photographer shooting as if he was just shooting stock. He never knew where we were at in 07. It wasn't even good stock. Right. Like, it was, um, it's, it's hard no, to say. We don't want to like, kick anybody. But no. It's, a, it's just a point. Like, as photographers, you've got to know your job, and the media relations has to understand what the photographer can do. Like, like you said, can't Absolutely. be in two places, can't do, you know, can't spin three plates at one time. Right. And, you know, there's there is a time and place also to go over if you have needs and wants, there's a there's a time and place for that. After the event is not that time and place yeah. to, to talk about right. what you didn't get me. Right. You can talk about what you're looking for, and it may or may not happen. Like at Cal State Fullerton, how many times have you heard, get me some groups of fans face painted, you know, cheering? Right. It doesn't happen at Cal State Fullerton. Right. We, so like knowing that that's either going to be fake or that it can't happen is half the battle. I don't have to fight that fight anymore because it's not going to happen. And you can walk out in the stands and see it for yourself. You see a group of fans that are there and you want a photo of it, all you have to do is ask and say, hey, can you snap a photo of this section during the fourth inning? They're going to be there. Right. You can, you can handle that. Right. You can, you can move. You can change lenses. Whatever you need to do to get that, you can do that. But after the fact, how come you didn't get that dog? Well, I was in the right field bullpen shooting such and such. Of course, I didn't see the dog running on the field. Like, right. It just just makes sense to like put yourself in that person's shoes for a second and realize that they've got a job to do and they're working on on stuff. And and hopefully the photographer is doing their job. Right. You know, like I have a lot of respect for you because I know you're working from the time you get there till the time you leave. That may not be the case for everybody, but something for them to aspire to. Right. I mean, I knew early on you, you were a, a little bit more visually aware than Ryan, well more aware than Mel. So when I can give you stuff, you were always using it well. And, and as it went on in our relationship, especially like in, when we were really hitting our stride, 9, 10, 11, I could provide you stuff. Like, if I would have provided bullpen, happy, happy, joking time, cool shafts of shadows, it wouldn't have gotten used. I could provide it to you, and you go, ooh, mm -hmm. that's nice. Yeah. Let me find a use. And I think that's more prevalent today, thank God, that there's photographers that are seeing that, and it's being used more. Um, and I think social media has that has helped that, especially with like Instagram. There's you avenues, could, yeah. Right. You would never have used that in a media guide. So it evolved in the way you shoot. Like my my take from 01 College World Series, I believe, is the best World Series I ever shot because I didn't have to worry about social media. I didn't have to worry about a gallery for us. We didn't have a website yet that took a gallery. That was still film, right? It, well, for me, it was film. Yeah. So I got to just shoot and never had to upload anything. David Gonzalez was there for Stanford, and I watched that poor bastard constantly have to upload for Stanford's website. He would leave, he'd have to upload some stuff, leave, and it, a lot of it was, because it was slow, it was speed, it was, but I've got stuff of guys doing just crazy, fun, unbelievable, beautiful things, and those shaft of light, of Rosenblatt, I never was able to really achieve that much Again, because by three, we were filling up galleries. And by our last World Series in 17, we were uploading in between innings. Right. 
So we were feeding Instagram stories and Twitter, and I was sending it to Rebecca or Becca, and she was you know uploading it up, and it's amazing from you and I's first one in sixteen to seventeen, hundred and eighty degrees. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I I gave you an inside cover photo. I think it was a full photo. Maybe it wasn't a full photo, but. Um, of an Omaha sunset photo with a fan silhouetted. So it had nothing to do with Cal State Fullerton because I saw those kind of cool images that you're you're picking out. Right. And I'm putting it prominent inside cover of a media guide that I could easily be spending putting so and so in. Right. There. So yeah, I definitely, you know, loved seeing those, you challenging yourself, you finding cool stuff. Again, the romantic side of Omaha, uh, Rosenblatt Stadium. Um, yeah, you you got to put your trust in. You got to put your trust in your photographer if you've got that relationship. If you're hiring a freelance, it's hard. To, it's hard to do. But do your homework. If you're trying to find that photographer that's going to cover your main guy the year that he right. can't make it, it I, I don't know. I mean, I, I relied on you, and it was just a bad. It ended up badly. Poorly. Right. I, I don't know what what happened there, but like I don't blame you. It wasn't you that did did that. Um, it just we didn't get what we needed, and we hardly have any usable photos from the College World Series. Right. Now I'll dip our toe in this a bit because if people really want to see this, they can go to Vimeo <laughs> and look at remembering Rosenblatt mm -hmm. one two three and the audio commentary. Beautiful, which I believe is priceless. It is, but. It's very similar to this. So when, when I say to you, hey, um, I got an idea. Let's try a documentary on Rosalblatt because they are going to knock it down and make it a bowling alley or whatever. Again, willingness. No, are you crazy? <laughs> We're supposed to go work. Th that process was one of the greatest things and it has no connection to Cal State Fullerton. Nope. But I you know, in my research with for you for this, I watched it and I just go, you can't find two guys having a better time in four days than what we had. Like it was absolute gold. Absolutely. Like if if there was groundhog day for four days <laughs> My wife's going to hear this podcast, but I would not have a problem getting stuck in those four days. Right. Because. Yeah, it was great. It was unbridled, adrenaline, happy, creating. Yes. Something we had no idea what we were doing, but it was watching two guys. And, you know, I, I look back on now 10 years. It's, it's been 10, 10 years. Where did time go? Right, you had a you had a fresh baby, right? I had no gray hair. No gray hair. We had squirrels. <laughs> we had much fuller, darker beards than we do in these <laughs> now, and we just went for it. Yeah. Just go. I'm like, not sure you you came up with that idea, and then the first thing that comes to my head was, how are we going to do this? Because there's a good chance we're going with the team. Right. How are we going to do this on top of all the other stuff? But because we'd only done small videos. We never had bitten off a documentary yet. Right. And we didn't even really use that term documentary as much as let's just go get footage. We, got, we have to. Of the like, last it, was, it was like we have to because it's going Rosenblatt. away. Yeah. Um, now, had, and I asked you this earlier, had there been yet a love for you? Had you understood Rosenblatt's beauty at yes. this point? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, when I first went, it was. It was like seeing Glenn Close in The Natural when the light hit her in the hat and she's backlit and you go, she'll never be that more beautiful. I remember walking in and seeing this and just going, oh God, a photographer built this place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> The I colors, think, the palettes. It was, yeah, like over the years. So at that point, I had been in 06, 07, seven, nine. nine and almost again in I 10, so I, like. I think we calculated you'd been there a month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, because I had spent, I, ha I have spent more time in the Midwest with you than anybody in my family. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, but over time, I think little pieces along the way, like built to that. Um, 
that trip in 10 is when I actually got to take a breath and actually see it. You're having those conversations. You're really listening. Like I had the headphones on with right. the microphone. I'm really listening to these people. I'm asking the questions. We're asking key people key things. Um, and you hear their recollection. And then the friendships that I've made, um, you know, they're not like best buddies. But when we go back and I see J.D. Hamilton and, you know, Glenn Sisk and Aaron Fitt and Kendall Rogers and uh, Eric Sorensen and Kyle Peterson, right. all the people that you've spent many summers with. I mean, I was just telling my dad, like, I don't know how many times I caught I mean, I do know how many times I called him from the stadium on Father's Day. Right. And told him happy Father's Day because I was missing Father's Day because I was in Omaha. Right. Um, it was a cool thing. So, again, the romantic side of me, like, starts piecing all these things together. And uh, it's really, Rosenblatt was a really cool place. Um, as much as it, all those wrinkles and cracks and that elevator was the worst. And y your, your solution is take the stairs. But for a big guy like me, taking well, the stairs wasn't I, always that fun. I, I didn't want to have another run-in with Tony <laughs> Gwynn again, so I really just <laughs> wanted to take the stairs. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, I, I mean, I, Rob Dibble got in my face when I told him it was hot and he was wearing a suit, and he's like, save it, buddy. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> sorry, Rob Dibble. Didn't mean to offend you by telling you how hot it was in the Midwest. But, um, yeah, it's a lot of good stories, good times, mainly with you. Um, you know, the work, the work was the work. Um, the athletes, it was for them. You know, we, I was never doing any of this for myself. It's always to make the athlete have a good time and right. we want you know we want to make sure that those memories are are saved whatever way whether it's in the story in the media guide or in the photos or however we want that to to look as cool as possible but um yeah it, it, it was a culmination of all those trips and then seeing people in their houses in their front porches in their tailgates for the first time, which I hadn't seen before, right. um, still we, we hadn't seen a real game go on that we weren't in the press box or in the photo well at that point. We, we had plans to, but we never sat down and watched the game. We didn't do that until 17. Yes. Was it 17, our last trip together? Um, we didn't do, we didn't actually get to see a game um, that wasn't ours uh, from the stands. Uh, we didn't eat. We thought we said we were going to eat in never the park. Did. We never ended up eating in the park. We had Zestos, and I think it passed statutory now. We could say that we were sexually assaulted in the parking lot. <laughs> and by we, we mean you. <laughs> you. You were there. I was there. Oh, that was good. Yeah. So, okay, I bring that yin to the yang. We go to Rosenblatt in 10. We do a documentary on Rosenblatt Stadium. Again, Willingness. I come to you and say, let's do a tearjerker. Have you talked to Derek Leg? And I believe that was 12? Yeah. Right. I want to say 12. So Derek Leg had played at Long Beach State, transferred, had come to Cal State Fullerton. One year, right? Just as one, he redshirted okay. in one senior year. Mm -hmm. And I have a knack of treating the players like my kids, and I will ask them first, how's school, how's everything else? I don't care about batting averages or pitching. I'll see that in the game. By doing that, I feel like I get an in to just have them take down the veil a little bit. Sure. I could take more natural photos. I find out about the story of his brother, Cody Lake. I believe sergeant. I'm trying to rethink this, but I think it was a sergeant. I think so, yeah. I bring this to you. And you, again, Mr. Willingness, says, sure, I love to cry. <laughs> just, again, you just go for it with me. Yeah, you know, I called you, I don't know, it was a couple weeks ago now, and I had just gotten done listening to our commentary on the 10-year anniversary of us doing this. And I called and thanked you for putting me in situations that I'd never thought I'd be in. And that was... Again, it's learning and growing and 
kind of putting myself out there in, in a way that I never would on my own. So uh, I am willing because you haven't let me down yet. <laughs> you haven't put me in a, in a spot that I absolutely hated. But like, yeah, that, I mean, what an opportunity to like go and tell that story. I, you know, looking back on all of these projects that we've done, I wish we had the money. I wish we had the backing. I wish we had the... You know, I we, I'm glad we didn't have the money. I am, t- I am too. But I, I just, I, because the, the stories I want to be told. Yes, it could have had just more, a little bit better. It like, could have had more color and depth, and but then, I think we lose, and I don't want to say control that it would have gotten out of control, but right, with just you and I, just the two of us can screw it up. Once you get more cooks, of course, in there, course. all of a sudden. It's an anti-pasta and it's not a salad. It's just <laughs> right. like, right? Like, yeah, okay, it's not perfect. No, 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 no. But it's that's ours. Absolutely. Like, that's, I, I 100% agree with that. 100%. Because I've had people see it and go, well, God, you didn't you didn't do this or you didn't do that. or It was I, may, maybe not bring other people, but I wish we could have done sure. X or could have done something else with the time or. I love the fact and this goes back to your, we did it. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. You know how many projects come across people's plates and they go, eh. Yes. It's not, it's not, it's not, we, it's not a Cal State Fullerton thing. Well, why do we need to do this? You we do did it, it because that's what creators do. Right. They do mm-hmm. it. And you need again, a kick in the butt every once in a while. So my willing. willingness is the kick in the butt. So um, is, is the yang to your ying kick in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> so... Not that Fullerton Athletics runs its course, but you decide after 15 years, there's an opportunity at ASI, and it's it's right for you. Tell me about that process. Uh, yeah, uh, at this point, I've, I've transitioned from being the media relations director into a graphic designer in the athletic department. I found an opportunity after Mel, my boss, Uh, decided to retire, that what if I became the department's graphic designer and stepped away from the media relations side of things? Um, Just as a, it was a good opportunity, it was a good breaking point, it was a good opportunity for me to stop that rat race of the media relations director. Like, my my life was, uh, you can ask my wife now, I was coming home, eating dinner, I was coming home late, eating dinner, and then getting back to work on things that I right. needed. We, we have a small child at the house and I've got a picture of me working on my computer with her sitting on my shoulders. That's how it was and it, it was it was too much. So I stepped away, became the graphic designer and there was more of a fo- marketing focus going on in the department at the time. We were selling sponsorships and fulfilling sponsorship um, agreements with marketing pieces and designs and promotional items. And that rat race, because I was the only graphic designer for now, instead of just being the graphic designer for the baseball and volleyball team, I am now the graphic designer for all 17 sports, the department, everything, all social media, all everything that has a visual aspect, I was touching. It's awesome. And that's a lot. It, yeah, it's awesome when you look back on it, but it was a ton. There, there should have been people running social media, there should have been people running promotions, there should have been, like, that's the way you set that group up, and it ended up falling on on the hands of three or four or five people in the department. And instead of 12. Instead of 12 or 15 or 20, yeah. So that, you know, politics were getting in the way in the office, and like you said, it just kind of ran its course. Um, I found an opening on campus. I, I, I didn't want to leave campus. I didn't want to leave the athletic department, but things just weren't weren't the way, they weren't moving in the direction that I wanted them to. Um, I'm getting older at this point. I'm in my 40s, and that rat race of being on call 24-7, 365, wasn't appealing to me. So there was an opening at, at ASI on campus, and it's an auxiliary of this, the of the campus. So it's, it's on Cal State Fullerton's campus, but I don't work for the state anymore, or I in the future wouldn't be working for the state anymore. Um, applied for that position. They had just had some transitions in that office and a design coordinator spot opened where, um, 
they overlook uh, a staff of graphic designers that that manage the graphic design for ASI, which encompasses the recreation center and the children's center and the student union and all the programs of the government and all the programs that the student. It's a it's a organization funded by the students for the students run by the students the process from leaving athletics into asi was it an easy decision and what is your process now at asi at the time it was very difficult very difficult decision i I had been in the department doing something since 1998 if you take it back to 1992 I had been in the athletic department in some way, shape, or form, or on campus since 1992, Jesus. and here we and here we are in 2018. Right. So, it was very difficult for me to have the the prospects of not working there anymore. But things were getting not good for me in the office. I was taking stuff home, and I shouldn't have been. Uh, I needed to get out. Right. It, was, it, was it was a lot was, of work. It, it was, was a lot of work. It was time, and there were politics. There were. Uh, personnel issues. There were all kinds of things right. going Long on. Long hours, and you need to be home. I need. I need to be done. I'm getting older. And I, I think need, that's lost a lot in media relations. That there's a lot of hours. I don't know how a guy like Mel or Bob Olson, uh, Bill Mahoney, who did it, like those guys have put in 30 years. And they raise they raise their kids on campus. Yes. I mean, they all worked events for them and grew up, and they took vacations together, right. and like that. They all worked. And you for obviously 30 years. didn't want to go there, so there's an opportunity arises. Right. And that, it's on campus. Yeah. And ASI was uh, that place. ASI is a, an auxiliary of the university. It houses the student government. It houses the recreation center. It houses the children's center. It houses the student union. Um, and it's run by the students, for the students, funded by the students, and all the fees. Um, so it was, it was an opportunity for me to stay on campus. And, um, and it's a bit of a teaching capacity it is um like i said it's it's run by the students they we have i want to say 350 student employees um, in our organization and there are only 80 professional staff so we are we have way more student staff than we do professional right. staff and that 80 number might be a little high it might be closer to 65 but um we've got all those student employees and we're there to mold and guide and teach um and keep a little bit of structure, you know, professional, sure. professional level uh, structure there and, and teach them as they're going and getting their degrees and whatever. I just so happen that all my students generally are going through the art program or have some kind of, of graphic design background. I've had a business major. I've had an engineer. I've, like they come in, but they've got some kind of skill um, in the graphic design realm. And I teach them what I've learned over the years. Um, I teach them our processes. I teach them. I kind of. Did that give, come easy? Uh, n- you the, live the, as a the teacher, trans, right? The, the, Your wife the, is a my teacher. Wife is did, a teacher. Did you go and say any pointers? Because it's uh, it's know, a lot different. It's not even an internship. You are doing a lot of teaching, and you're trying to teach a process. This is the way we do it. I mean, so I have asked her along the way. I, I just I kind of I taught some interns. I've managed a, a press box staff. Right. I went about it that way. Okay. I've had some issues along the way where I'd lean on her and say, how would you handle stuff like this? I Early on, I had a little bit of a, a problem student that right. was giving me, and I'd ask her, how do you think I should go about this? Right. How and do then, you motivate this kid? Yeah, and then along the way, once that person left, I had this staff that made it so easy to, uh, to teach. Like they were willing and wanting information. They'd ask me information. And since I've had numerous phone calls from all of that first group of staff that I had asking for advice in their professional life, which is very fulfilling knowing that I've only been there just two years now. Um, so that process is, it, it, was it easy? It wasn't easy at the beginning. I'm still daily trying to like, figure out what that 
what that uh, process is like. And then we throw this whole coronavirus into the mix. And, um, you know, we've we kept the students on for a number of months and then we had to furlough them. So there's this like there's this divide now. So now sure. I'm trying to to forge ways to get other people involved and and keep things going. So when we do get back to a semi normal stage and we rehire our students, we're back into the swing of things. So because your day to day is not a website, a media guide, a poster, and there's a little more hands on teaching, what keeps your creative juices firing on all cylinders to be creative at a teaching level? Right? Because you're not making or enhancing websites or posters, but you're kind of like, you don't want to tell them how to do a project, but yet what keeps you fired up? Well, I'll, I'll be, the graphic design side of me got a little more fired up by them. Okay. Because I, come, I came from where I was watching social media and watching other schools and how other teams were handling their stuff. And wow, that looks really good. We should do something like them. We should do a photo shoot like this. Whereas I came over and now I'm marketing to students who are old enough to be my children. Right. Um, or young enough to be my children, however you want to say that, and their likes and tastes and what catches their eye is totally different than what caught my eye, and it's different than an athletic side. Oh, so, absolutely. So I actually got reconnected with graphic design by taking this job. I start following different things on social media. Um, is that where you're getting a lot of your influence? Well, it's it's... It's probably the first thing. Okay. Because I'm, if, as I'm checking, I'm following hashtags, I'm following design sites. I'm now, you know, I'm following Photoshop. You know what I mean? Like, right. I follow these accounts where I'm seeing visually what is capable. Um, um, I'm, I'm listening more to the music that the kids are listening to. Ooh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, but but <laughs> I mean, we have a we have a studio where, sure. where all of us are in there, and I'm listening to this music. Some things are good, some things are horrible, but it's what they listen to and what they like. And if you, I have to market to them, I need to at least have a knowledge you, of this. Right. That's what I was going to say. You you now have to think like a 18 to 21 year old and visually what catches them. Right. Um, Has that been difficult? Some some styles are difficult. I, I, you go, why do you like that? Right. But that that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Right. <laughs> like it doesn't matter. I'm finding that it doesn't matter. Like they like it. They like it. It doesn't matter why. Like we've done some things in our office that I go, why are we spending money on this as an organization? Right. And all the students are like, I want one of those, like a shirt design right. or something. Like I'm like, why, why? Um, that's just my, my style. Right. Like, it's not a judgment on what they like. It's right. just like I grew up when I grew up, and I like what I like, and right. that's that's crazy. You but, want a maroon short sleeve, you know, yeah. tank top? Everybody Whatever. wants this right. like long sleeve, off colored, with minimal designs on it. I'm like, why are we spending money on this? Right. But it's what the kids it's like. What, it's what the kids like. So right. Um, I'm sure everybody looked at your mullet and said, why? Really? Yeah. <laughs> why? My yeah. But it's business. And it's party. <laughs> Coach said no more party. Right. <laughs> but if you want to so, play. But that's, that again, willingness to learn and adapt and to see what they're doing. That's a yeah. hell of a good trait to have because there's a lot of people that get to an age, 40 into 50, and go, I don't care what they like. This is what we're making. This is how we're advertising. This is our widget. Deal with it. Yeah. No, I, I mean... <laughs> I feel that way inside. I feel right. that I am willing, but I also like there. I got this fight because I don't design that way. So my designs often look the same as they always have, but I've got this influence. At least I can appreciate or try and piece these things together to get as close as I can right. to what it is they like. But yeah. Um, Do you think you have a style? <sighs> That's a tough question. It's, uh, I feel 
my design style and philosophy is to make the image as clean and concise and make the client happy. That, I mean, ultimately that, mm -hmm. that's it. And that's a hard thing to do because the client wants everything. Absolutely. And you can't put everything in the kitchen sink on an Instagram post. Right. So trying to find and extract what it is the client really wants and give them something that fulfills their everything with a, an image. Um, I tried doing that in athletics a lot. They, they wanted 15 things on a brochure. Right. And you gotta make that 50, those 15 things look as pretty as you can. And eye popping and catch yeah. and make them stop and read. And, and there's a email and a website and a phone number. And I'm all, all that stuff. And they want it everywhere and it's difficult. So I think that my skill is finding that balance and making it look good. I'm using the same techniques in Photoshop that I've used for 20 years. Since, since that 1998, I'm using the same techniques. I am using what I learned at my internship to this day in Photoshop that makes things way easier. Um, so I like to refer to my style as kind of nuts and bolts. I do it and I get it done, make it clean, um, like you kind of alluded, like I handled your photographs well. Like I didn't chop hands off the wrong way. I didn't change the color. I didn't run Photoshop filters over the top of, you know, I did, when I did those things, it was with a purpose to create an, an aesthetic of, right. of sorts. It wasn't because the photo needed help. Right. So, or a fad. Uh, yeah. I, I, I didn't follow a lot of that. I, I don't. I mean, like I said, we'd try and emulate this or emulate that, but we would never copy or do it just because a, a coach said they wanted it or whatever. Right. Um, so that, that's, that's my style. Like, I don't really, I, I've, I've been thinking about it and like, I don't have any like design heroes or I don't follow people that way. Um, I like craftsmen. And that can be a craftsman that built this table that we were talking about that we're sitting at. Um, it can be a craftsman um, that uh, makes sourdough bread. Right. Um, I, I always thought of you as a craftsman house. Like you're a classic craftsman house. If you were a house. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. You're just, that's you. You're not, it's not like modern flamboyant, you know, those square cubed glasses that faded right. out in the eighties or something with, you know, bad brick. You're just like this really well-built classic craftsman house gets the job done, never lets you down. You know what to expect in the design. It's going to last forever and never goes out of style. I really can't leave you with anything more than that. But that's <laughs> I appreciate what I've always that. thought. I, how, I appreciate that. Right, because what I, I see your style. I don't know if other people do, but I look at it that way. Right. Because I'll see some things and I go, oh, that's hot, but it's going to be dead in six months. That style's yeah. out the window. Right. Because that person's living off a filter or a fad or a quick trend. Right. Great. Um, I saw a lot of it oh, 10, 12 years ago. EA Sports had this look. ESPN adapted it and it just ran hot and all of a sudden everybody's shooting that way and it's just like, now I can't tell the difference between an ad for Tide and an ad for right. ESPN because they're all just, and you're like, ooh, boy. Yeah. Just yeah. make your stuff look like a Dodger logo or a Yankee logo. <laughs> Absolutely. And it lasts forever. I mean, that, if you were to ask me, those are the types of things that catch my eye, too. So I don't know if that's permeated, like Cardinals, Dodgers, right. Yankees. Those things stick with me. Right. Um, Not Padres, uh, you know, Which Padres? Right. <laughs> Astros. Right. The angels have morphed a million times. Yep. Stay in your lane. Be classic. I'd agree with that. Perfect. I would agree with that. Well, with that, I'm going to say I have had one hell of a good time. Me too. Thank you so much. I haven't talked about myself like this. Well, I'm glad we've <laughs> got it down on digital ones and zeros so your great grandkids can hear this. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank right. you very much. Mike, it's been an absolute pleasure. You're the best. You too. Thanks, See Michael. Ya. Please hit the like button where you found us. 